Greetings, God bless, and welcome to the Beginning and End podcast, the official podcast of the beginningandend.com website. And of course, we are a Christian news site dedicated to covering issues affecting the church, end time Bible prophecy, the Nephilim, pop culture, many, many topics you can find at beginningandend.com are linked to our website, our social media, our YouTube channel, our podcast are all in the show description. Please, uh, we encourage you to check it out, subscribe, sign up, and help learn and grow in your knowledge of the Savior. So today's show is going to be part six in our Nephilim series, The Nephilim and the Alien Gospel Deception. So aliens, do they exist? Did aliens create the human race? Will aliens return to Earth? Are angelic beings actually aliens? So, you know, these are the questions that many people are, whether you are a student, whether you are an adult, a child, a professor, a philosopher, many people, or in a theologian or a Christian, or many people are debating these questions. And so we thought it was very important. It would be hard to do a discussion of the Nephilim and not mention the alien and UFO phenomenon at all. So, because the Bible is clear, and so we demonstrated this certainly in part four, the Nephilim and the great secret of the occult. We really got into, when you look at passages like Revelation chapter nine, Revelation 12, you see references to angelic beings returning to earth in the end times for all people to see openly manifesting. So, Given that the Bible says that's going to happen, how could this be, what kind of deception could be used to, how could these beings present themselves? They could present themselves as aliens from another planet. And hence the title, The Alien Gospel Deception, because there are already at work many, whether in pop culture or research shows or books or blogs or vlogs, who are pushing this idea of aliens as the true creators of humanity. And so that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to start right away with the TV show Ancient Aliens. And so we're going to really, we take a look at that in the article and really talk about how this show, I believe they're in season 12 now. It's been on for many, many years. And Essentially, it looks at different paranormal and ancient phenomena and tries to attribute everything back to aliens and the idea that aliens are responsible for pretty much anything paranormal, supernatural, or even things that are ancient and just astounding, whether they be megaliths, the pyramids, uh, Chichen Itza, all these, the Nazca lines, that these are all connected to extraterrestrial beings from another planet in our universe. And so, of course, it is our contention, the beginning and end, that all these manifestations that people claim of an alien, an extraterrestrial, or a UFO are actually spirit realm beings. These are fallen angelic or demonic manifestations, not beings from Alpha Centauri or Mars or Neptune. So, and again, we see in scripture, the Bible has and details instances of either angelic beings or God the Lord himself interacting with humans. Of course, in the garden of Eden, Adam and Eve spoke with God. They spoke to Satan. All of them were together at one point in a conversation when they were being judged by God. So there was clear interaction there. After Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, the Lord stationed a cherubim and a heavenly, a divine sword that could spin on its own to guard the entrance to the garden of Eden. And then of course, in Genesis chapter six, we have the sons of God who rebelled against the Lord, these angels who took human women as wives. In Genesis 6, we read, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And so, of course, that's clearly, once you have marriage and intimate relations, the heavenly angelic realm is clearly intersecting and manifesting in front of human beings. And so... The Bible makes this clear and very plainly, but now we're going to see how ancient aliens tries to explain even what angels are. So this is from an episode. We're going to play a clip from their episode that was called Aliens and Angels. So they even try to explain many of the things described in the Bible and attribute it to alien races. So here's a clip right now from that show. <laughs>
angels. According to a Nielsen survey taken in 2010, nearly 70% of Americans believe in their existence. But what are they? Winged visitors from God as depicted in the Bible? Smiling cherubs who peer down at us from billowing clouds? Or something much, much more? The concept of angels is obviously very uh, widespread, uh, in, uh, certainly in American culture. And you find it in Latin culture, Greek culture, Babylonian culture. When we think of angels, we immediately think to the Bible. But when you go onto the internet, when you read books, you will find that people have visitations of angels every single day. In the Hebrew Bible's book of Genesis, Angels first appear as divine beings, sent to earth as messengers of God. They wanted to have God interacting with the human beings, but it seems so undignified to have God uh, directly operating, and so he sent messengers. The word angel is a mistranslation. In Hebrew, the word for angel is malach. However, the correct translation is not angel at all, but it is in fact messenger. In Greek, the word angelos is not angel. It is intermediary, middleman. And so what do we have in these stories? We have these intermediaries, these messengers, bringing information from quote-unquote God. By definition, angels are otherworldly. Angels are extraterrestrial. They're not from this planet. So really, by definition, ETs and angels are the same. Now, our modern conception of ETs have changed. But go back thousands and thousands of years when angels lived among our biblical ancestors. They didn't call them ETs. They called them angels. But they knew they were not of this world, not of this planet. So you see how clever the show is. I mean, they start off. And by the way, the first speaker was a, was a Catholic priest. And they start off by immediately challenging how the Bible describes angels or defines angels. That they say, well, you know, the term Allah doesn't actually mean angel, it means messenger. Which, of course, anyone who studies the Bible knows that, yes, the term in Hebrew means messenger. They were messengers from God. It was just describing their role. But certainly that's where we derive angel from. And, you know, this is common knowledge. They... Also then try to say just very swiftly that while well, they knew that they're, they are, they're extraterrestrials. So already they're trying to move away from the Bible and get right to this notion that they're from another planet. They're actually aliens and that even in ancient times, the biblical figures knew they just called them angels instead. Instead of calling them aliens or ET because they didn't have the term ET yet. And so here's something even more interesting. We're going to go to a clip from Ancient Aliens where they attempt to explain the flood in the days of Noah. Qumran, Palestine, 1946. In the desert, 10 miles east of Jerusalem, a Bedouin shepherd leaves his flock of sheep and goats to look for a stray. Walking along the cliffs, the shepherd spots a cave in the distance. He threw a stone into a cave 
and he heard the crack of breaking pottery. So he went in to investigate and found jars that contained ancient manuscripts. The Bedouin shepherd's find led to a discovery of 11 caves that contained the most extraordinary cache of literature, arguably in human history, the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are 800 pieces of literature found in these 11 caves, and it tells us so much about the ancient world. One of the amazing revelations is a story about Noah that we don't see in the Old Testament. And the story is that when Noah is born, he's an extraordinary baby with a strange complexion and the ability to light up the room with his eyes. What's interesting is that you actually have Noah's father, Lamech, questioning whether or not Noah is his son. And this is due to the fact that we have this story about these fallen angels that came down and had sex with women. Lamech confronts his wife, Bittenach. Is it my son or is it, is it one of theirs? Noah's exterior is described as very foreign. His eyes are described to be glowing like sunbeams. His skin is glowing as well. Now that's a very bizarre description. And so one has to ask the question, what if Noah was one of the extraterrestrials? Could it be, as ancient astronaut theorists suggest, that the biblical figure of Noah was, in fact, an alien being. Is this the reason he is described as having a strange complexion and glowing eyes? The key thing that's going on with Noah is that he is pure in God's sight, and so is his family. And this purity seems to be genetic as much as what you might call spiritual. And so when God makes plans to wipe out the rest of humanity, what he's wiping out is the extraterrestrial dimension of humanity that has come about through the pollution of human genetics. So isn't that inter interesting? So first off, you know, that clip, they start off by saying, oh, we have an account that's not in the Bible. Of course, they go to the book of Enoch, which is a part of Pseudepigrapha. These books were written in roughly the third to second century BC, and they were not. There are many books like the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch, book of Jasher, book of Jubilees are just a small sampling of the many pseudepigraphal books that were written at that time. And what the book says that has this account of Noah as a baby, his father, Lamech, uh, expressing dread because Noah basically appears to be superhuman. His eyes are glowing. He has an angelic appearance. So he wonders if this is even his son and, and basically questions his wife's faithfulness to him. Of course, none of this is in the Bible. The Bible says in Genesis chapter six that when God was destroying the earth, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, as we explained in our part one of the series, Bloodlines of the Nephilim, that we go into detail that what made Noah distinct, aside from the fact that he was a faithful believer and preacher of faith in God, was that he was perfect in his generations, meaning he was purely human. He was purely human. His, his bloodline was not intermingled with the seed of the fallen angels who were taking human women as wives. And so that made him, of course, the ideal selection to continue the human race after the flood. Ancient Aliens, of course, this TV show ignores all that and instead goes to this account from the book of Enoch, which is never in scripture, which contradicts the Bible, and then try to say that Noah himself was an alien. So the show is very clever, and they use lots of priests on the show, people who are theologians, to give it an air of Christian credibility, when, of course, these 
uh, speakers have no credibility because they're clearly not Bible believers. Um, they're not espousing or teaching biblical Christianity. They're teaching apostate Christianity. And so this is, uh, what this show does in a very, very clever fashion. So, you know, this is a big deception and they do this all the time. There are many, many episodes that try to explain away the Bible as basically saying, well, some of this is true, but it was actually aliens. It wasn't really God or Jesus. These were just alien beings. So, uh, next up, I want to look at the movie Prometheus, directed by Ridley Scott. That was one of the biggest films in recent years that pushed this concept of aliens in the place of God. That aliens, in fact, were our creators, also known as panspermia, that they created humanity and seeded this earth many, you know, billions of years ago. And so the Prometheus movie was about a team of scientists and astronauts who headed into space to locate an alien race. Now, we're not going to play the clip now because it doesn't, it's really more sound than anything, but there, you know, if you go to the article, we will have a clip and certainly in the video of this opening scene where one of the aliens who is apparently being punished to death, he has to drink a poison which dissolves his body and he's presumably on earth standing in ancient earth by a waterfall and he drinks the solution which dissolves his body he disintegrates into dust and that dust goes into the waterfall rushing into rivers and you see the image of that dust turning into dna and this is the opening of the movie so the whole concept is that aliens created humanity that through evolution of that dna and those particles eventually a human being came out of the muck and they are actually our creators and the whole plot of the movie which is set in the future is centers around this woman dr shaw who is an archaeologist who's recruited to conduct an excavation on mars by the whaling corporation which is kind of the the corporation in every aliens movie i guess and the interesting thing about this character, Dr. Shaw, and it shows Ridley Scott's agenda, who was the director of the film and making the movie, is that she is a Christian. She's the daughter of Christian missionaries, and she's a devout believer. She wears a cross in the beginning of the film. And in her research, what she became a specialist in was noticing that her discovering that ancient cultures who lived thousands of years ago were making a similar drawing of a map of stars in space and a godlike race. Who, that were giants, by the way, towering over people. And so we show these images in the article from the movie. And what occurs is that the way the corporation believes that these etchings are also found on Mars. So she discovers that that's the case. And there's actually a map that can lead them back to this alien race that created humanity, allegedly. And they go back to the alien home planet. And there they discover sort of a temple that contains thousands of containers with the genetic material of every species. I guess that's on Earth. And they have this black liquid substance in them. And the kind of the same substance that we see in the beginning of the movie when the alien first creates humanity by dissolving his body. What's interesting there, what takes place from there is the, sh the, the movie then builds this whole storyline around Dr. Shaw's basically conversion from Christianity to believing in the alien gospel. And another part of her as a character is that she's unable to have a baby. It's something she struggles with. Well, lo and behold, there's a character, there's a character on the ship, one of her fellow shipmates on this expedition into deep space. They develop a romantic relationship. That same ship member was actually poisoned with the black alien substance unbeknownst to him. He drank it. And so it was in his bloodstream. And soon he becomes romantically involved with Shaw and impregnates her with an alien hybrid baby. And you see clips in this in the movie where they show that the alien, they do an analysis of the alien DNA, and it's a match to human DNA. Again, showing that we are their descendants. So this movie goes way, way out there to promote this idea in a major way. And Ridley Scott himself has gone on record sharing his beliefs that you know, that this is what he believes. And we quote him where he says, that he, there's a writer, this is Ridley Scott speaking, there's a writer, Eric Van Daniken, Van Daniken. One of his most famous books was called Chariots of the Gods. Everyone thinks he was out of his mind, you know, for number one, quote, we are the creation of the gods. Things have changed dramatically that you can start looking at the idea that all our history can be completely wrong and misguided. Because at some point, someone had to put a statement down and have their own thesis, have their own theories. 
that was later accepted or later is gradually dissolved and redrawn or reworked. So you've now got the whole change attitude with NASA, the church, and I think even Hawking. And I think, and so he's saying that, you know, now basically everyone concedes that there are probably thousands of different life forms in the galaxy. And Scott went on to say that, and I think the church has conceded as well, that it would not be against the word of God if we conceded that there are other life forms in this galaxy. So if you take that out, then the door is open. To me, it's entirely logical. It's extremely ridiculous to believe that we are the only ones here. That was my first thought, is that for us to be sitting here right now is actually mathematically impossible without a lot of assistance. Who assisted? Who made the right decisions? Who was pushing and pulling to adjust us? That's a fair question. So he, of course, references uh, Eric Von Daniken's Chariot of the Gods, a book written in the 1960s. And Eric Von Daniken is kind of the forefather of the ancient alien, the alien gospel movement. That book was basically the first major book to put forth this idea that aliens are, in fact, not only do they exist, but they're actually our forefathers. And right you know, from the gate in his book, I'm just going to read a very small portion of it. He's attacking the Bible. And this is from pages 44 and 45 of Chariots of the Gods. And there, Von Daniken writes, The Bible is full of secrets and contradictions. Genesis, for example, begins with the creation of the earth, which is reported with absolute geological accuracy. How did the, how did the writer know that minerals preceded plants and plants preceded animals? Then he quotes Genesis 126, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Why does God speak in the plural? Why does he say us, not me? Why are, not my? One would think that the one and only God ought to address mankind in the singular, not the, not the plural. Von Daniken continues. Once again, of course we know, that, by the way, I'll take a break from reading from him. Obviously, the, we know that the Godhead is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, as demonstrated all throughout Scripture. So yes, they, they could say us. God can say us. But moving on, he writes, Once again, we have the sons of God who interbreed with human beings. Here, too, we have the first mention of giants. Giants keep on cropping up in all parts of the globe, in the mythology of the East and West, in the sagas of Tiwanaku, and the epics of the Eskimos. Giants haunt the pages of almost all ancient books, so they must have existed. What sort of creatures were they, these giants? Were they our forefathers who built the giant buildings and effortlessly handled the monoliths? Or were they technically skilled space travelers from another star? So, one, he challenges the Bible, and two, he goes right to Genesis 6 and tries to reimagine the account of the Nephilim as saying that they, you know, they're probably space aliens from another star. And of course, you know, this is about taking God's word and twisting it for their own purposes, for their own sinful imagination. And so, of course, you know, the Bible speaks about this. It says, you know, Romans chapter 1, you know, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And that's saying that you know what the Bible says, but you either deny it or twist it or try to lie about it. You hold it unrighteously. And that's exactly what these men are doing. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So this this passage from Romans 1 uh, powerful, beautiful passage explains that all people know intuitively that God exists, but it's when we deny God, when we hold his word untruthfully, when we give no thanks and say we want to not glorify him, that then we get vain imaginations. And the vain imaginations are things like the Prometheus story, the alien gospel, chariots of the gods. This is when your own imagination starts ruling your heart, and that is a great danger. And and. and You know, really, Ridley Scott was so determined to challenge the Bible in this film. He even admitted that in the early version of the script, the engineers, which was the name of the aliens in the book and in the movie, they're called the engineers. They were going to explain that, you know, it it turns out in the movies that the aliens want to destroy humanity now. Even though they created humanity, thousands of years later, they want to destroy humanity. And the reason why is because of the violence and sin 
and wickedness of humanity, that we couldn't get along with each other, so now our forefather aliens want to kill us. But what's interesting is that Scott said in the interview that we quote and cite in the article that he was going to have the aliens explain that they sent Jesus 2,000 years ago when things were really getting bad, and the fact that he was killed was one of the main reasons why the aliens want to destroy humanity. So he was even going to say that Jesus Christ, the Lord, was an alien emissary who was just sent to help humanity. And so this, of course, is blasphemy. And this is the danger of this deception. And uh, we get into all this, of course, in the article in much greater detail. And we'll just look at one little more example that we looked at. And that was the television series V, um, which came on ABC a few years ago. Not the old series from the 80s, for those who may remember that. There was a, a reimagined version of it that came on ABC several years ago. And again, it's about aliens showing up. In all, all over the major cities all over the world and presenting themselves as saviors of humanity. They can heal people. They can solve our economy. They can clean the water and clean the environment. And they're offering all this technology and, and of, you know, just being totally benevolent with their supernatural abilities and technology. And so what happens on the show, they're actually many people even worship them as gods. And, you know, from the, the, Initial episode shows a priest, you know, saying basically that, hey, you know, they're doing a better job than we are. And um, there's many references to the aliens replacing God on the show. And in fact, in the pilot episode, when the alien ships enter the atmosphere over New York City, they start causing a little tremors and earthquakes. And it shows in a church an, an enormous crucifix with Christ on it falling off the wall and smashing. And so, you know, this and the, the symbolism and imagery like that throughout the show is rampant. And so, again, it's all this is subtle symbols of the superiority of the alien gods over Jesus. And so one example you want to look at is one episode where the aliens get fully integrated into society and decide to go visit the Vatican because they want to win over, I guess, the Catholic people. And here we see, again, the message of this deception. So we're going to we're going to go to this clip now from the TV series V. I welcome you to the Vatican. New ABC Tuesday at 9 8 Central. I'm humbled by your presence. The visitors came for our bodies. You're my friends. I'm going to find out who did this. Now they're after our souls. How many miracles do you think it would take for your followers to turn from you to me? Heaven help us. Oh my god. In the name of faith, of course. ABC's V, all new Tuesday at 9, 8 central on ABC. All in the name of faith, of course. Right. Nice one liner. So while that was a very dramatic, obviously, trailer, you know, it really shows how this could happen. How, you know, if aliens were to come and manifest on Earth that, I, you know, people would worship them. People would see them as gods and not coincidentally. The underlying theme of the show, V, was that they were trying to manipulate human DNA to control humanity. And there are aliens who, of course, are having intimate relationships with human beings. And at the end, it's a hybrid alien human hybrid baby who is the key to aliens dominating humanity for good. So this show really hits on lots of the themes that we've discussed throughout the Nephilim series. Another interesting thing is that the Vatican has actually, in real life, the real Vatican has already acknowledged the possibility of aliens existing, and Pope Francis has said that if we find aliens, we, they should be able to be baptized for salvation if they want to be baptized. So they actually are fully on board with the alien message. And so we really go through many different examples. We talked about also about a show called Childhood's End, which is a mini series that came on... Um, about a year ago, and that series on the Sci-Fi Channel, and that series again was also about angels. I'm sorry, aliens who present themselves as benevolent beings, but don't actually reveal their appearance. And when they finally do, the alien leader looks exactly like a depiction of Satan. But you know, the people accept him anyway. So it's really some scary stuff being put out there in entertainment to promote this message. And so, as Christians, we just need to be guarded and be prepared and with the truth. And make sure that our eyes are not deceived by any end times deception. Of course, 
Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only now, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, you know, in a recent survey um, from a global demo demographic analytics firm, of 26,000 people, 60% said they believe in extraterrestrial life. So this is despite the fact that there is no empirical scientific evidence to support it. Isn't it interesting that people constantly demand evidence from Christians and say, show us God. Where is he? Prove it. Show me scientific evidence. But alien life, they're willing to accept, even though they've never seen an alien or UFO, there's been no evidence of them, they still believe they exist. So the table is set for a deception. We, again, as Christians, just need to be on guard about all these things. The end times kingdom will be one that is filled with lying signs and wonders, false miracles and false deceptions. And we want to let people know God's truth. The last thing that we reference, I want to reference today in this program is uh, John Keel. John Keel is one of the most famous UFO alien researchers of all time. And he was uh, not a Christian. He was a believer in aliens. But the interesting thing is that he later on in his life came to conclude that UFO and alien manifestations were actually demonic and spiritual. And he wrote, throughout most of history, the manifestations of demonology and demonop demonopathy have been viewed from a religious perspective and explained as the work of the devil. The bizarre manipulation and ill effects described in the, in the demonological literature are usually regarded as a result of a great unseen conflict between God and the devil. In UFO lore, the same conflict has been observed, and the believers have explained it as a space war between the Guardians, good guys, who are protecting our planet, and some evil extraterrestrial race. The manifestations are the same, only the referent is different. Did ancient man misinterpret UFO manifestations by placing them in a religious context? Apparently not. And so he concludes by saying Operation Trojan Horse, which is how he refers to the alien phenomena, is merely the same old game in a new updated guise. The devil's emissaries of yesteryear have been replaced by the mysterious men in black. The quasi-angels of biblical times have become magnificent spacemen. The demons, devils, and false angels were recognized as liars and plunderers by early man. The same imposters now appear as long-haired long -haired Venusians. So Keel, who, by the way, the show X-Files, the, the character Fox Mulder is based on John Keel. He also, his work also inspired the movie The Mothman Prophecies, which was made twice. So there's, he is well regarded in this space. And his conclusion was that in the end, this is all demonic. It's all just the fallen angelic demonic realm menacing humanity. So as society moves far, farther from God and knowledge of the Bible, the door to deception opens wider. And so we need to be on guard against this alien deception, against this idea that aliens are true creators. We know the truth, beloved. So share it with people. Share the gospel of forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. The enemy will use any deception, distortion, or parody to confuse the minds of people, to distract them from their need for salvation. So share the truth. And so that's our program for today. We hope you enjoyed it. We will be concluding. We're finally getting to part seven of the Nephilim series. What did church fathers believe about the Nephilim? We're going to go all the way back. We were just talking about the future and aliens. Now we're going to go back to the first century A.D., and look at what did the early church actually think about Genesis 6? The Nephilim, the sons of God, the daughters of men. Did they have any thoughts on it? Was it something they debated? Well, you will find out. Um, spoiler alert, yes, they did debate it and they did know about it. What did they say about it? That you will find out in our next episode um, in the Nephilim series. So 
Thank you again for tuning in. For more information, again, please go to our show description where you can find links to our website, to our social media outlets, to our YouTube page, as well as our podcast. We encourage you to subscribe, review, and share God's word with this world. Thank you again, and may God bless you abundantly.